everybody, and welcome to The Balancing Act. I'm Julie Moran. And I'm Olga Villaverde. Today, we're going behind the mystery. From neck pain to narcolepsy, what you need to know. And do we have a deal for you? Get ready to shop and save. That's right, shop and save. And it all starts right now. Today on Behind the Mystery, we're talking about narcolepsy, a condition that affects around one in 2,000 people in the U.S. It's often an underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed disorder. And for one woman, it was quite the journey. Narcolepsy can be described as struggling to stay awake or nodding off at inappropriate times. It can affect a person's ability to work, attend school, and build personal relationships. Christine has been living with her condition for over 25 years. My symptoms started around age 12 when I was in um, junior high. I was falling asleep all day in class. The other kids were mean. They thought it was a joke. They'd always just slam books next to my ears and watch me just like jump out of my sleep. School called for um, a parent conference. I was failing in school and to be able to graduate, I had to take night classes. It affected my social life. We'd have sleepover parties and like I would fall asleep right away. I was doing my homework on the floor and I fall asleep in my book. My dad was like, Christine, Christine, wake up. He was trying to wake me up and he thought something was wrong with me because he couldn't wake me up and he got scared. I started to like wake up out of this deep sleep and when he's like, okay, something's just like not right. Dr. Raj is a pulmonary critical care sleep specialist and has dedicated his career to helping patients with narcolepsy. When I want to explain narcolepsy, I define it as a chronic neurological condition where there's a disconnect about day and night. When we talk about the onset of symptoms, it happens younger in life. It doesn't care about gender. So males and females are both equal. One in 2,000 people in the United States may have narcolepsy. And I gotta say, that number is underdiagnosed because of the lack and delay and because it mimics many other diseases. It takes almost 10 years sometimes to make the correct diagnosis. A patient has to see even up to six doctors before they get the correct diagnosis. There are five symptoms of narcolepsy. You don't need to have all five symptoms to be diagnosed. When I think about the symptoms of narcolepsy, I kind of put them into the big five. Number one, it's always gonna be excessive daytime sleepiness. This is the most debilitating. People during the day are falling asleep from irresistible attacks of sleepiness. Cataplexy, it's when you lose muscle tone. It could be weakness of the legs, buckling of the knees. It could be only in the face. It could be drooping of your eyes, slurring of your speech, poor sleep at night. They have multiple awakenings and arousals, making the daytime twice as hard. Sleep paralysis, there's a disconnect between the brain and the body. You're awake, but your body is still stuck in REM sleep and you can't move. Hypnagogic and hypnopopnic hallucinations. Your body puts your mind in this hyper aroused state. And sometimes you see something out of the corner of your eye, you may see a shadow out there. It could be scary. You're not gonna have all five symptoms at the same time. They could appear at different times in life. Along with excessive daytime sleepiness, Christine also experienced cataplexy. I lose muscle tension in my neck. Sometimes my knees will buckle. If I laugh, my face would droop. Around my family, they're really hilarious. They just make jokes all the time, and I'd be like afraid to hang out with them or be around the family because um, I lose um, my muscle tension in my neck. So I'd be embarrassed. <laughs> and how scared can you possibly be where you're just laughing and all of a sudden you can't stand, your arm's not working, your vision's getting blurry, you can't even get the words out. Christine was telling me very emotional stories where no one knew what this cataplexy was. Uh, my nephews and my sister's side of the family, they really didn't understand because they lived far away. Um, they just thought that I wanted to be my, by myself. They didn't miss spending time on my phone. 
Around 50% of patients who have narcolepsy have probably been undiagnosed. The symptoms of narcolepsy mimic so many other diseases. Things like depression, things like anxiety, ADD, ADHD. So they see many doctors. There is a resource out there called morethantired.com. It's a great place where if you think you suffer from narcolepsy or know someone who has it, they have a screening questionnaire. So it tells you, hey, maybe I should go see a physician. And on that note, there is a physician finder to find out who is close to you who actually is familiar with this disorder. I went to my family physician and got evaluated. They did the blood work and it came out clear and they didn't understand, so then they referred me out to a neurologist and then schedule the sleep study because she was unclear of what was going on. How do we diagnose people with narcolepsy? The test we do is number one, we get an overnight sleep study. We call that a polysomography. We have EEGs attached to your brain. We're looking at your heart rate. We have your movements. Then you'll pursue what's called a MSLT. That stands for multiple sleep latency test. It's kind of a napping study. So based upon criteria on how fast you fall asleep and how many times you go into REM sleep with the right history and physical, we can make a diagnosis. So 25 years ago, um, being diagnosed um, meant a week long study. My parents were very supportive. They went with me to the hospital and I stayed there by myself and was kind of scared. It's a big white room with a clear glass mirror and they hook you up to electrodes. My emotions were just confused, didn't know what was going on, just waiting for results. We went back to the neurologist and um, they sat down and finally diagnosed me with narcolepsy. Relief can come with finally being diagnosed, which is why it's important to be aware of your symptoms and speak to a sleep specialist if you suspect you have narcolepsy. When I talk to my patient with narcolepsy, whether it's before the diagnosis or after, I want to give them the confidence that there is a diagnosis. People out there do suffer. So after being diagnosed, I felt more positive, hung out with the family a lot more often, um, and not feel ashamed. A year ago, I got referred to Dr. Raj. You can open up to Dr. Raj like a book. So since there's no cure for narcolepsy, Dr. Raj has been really patient. When I think of Christine, it reminds me that every treatment is individualized. Every patient with narcolepsy is unique. There are certain things that patients need, and one treatment plan doesn't fit everyone. Doing the research helped me find some people that had narcolepsy that understood my symptoms. Um, understood what I was going through because they were going through the same thing. Be your own advocate. Don't give up. If you think you have any of these symptoms discussed, visit morethantired.com to take the symptom screener and find a sleep specialist near you. You can also visit our website at thebalancingact.com. We'll be right back. Our necks perform more range of motion than anywhere else on the spine, and this makes our neck extra vulnerable to overexertion and joint degeneration. Thanks to modern medicine and advances in artificial disc replacement, today's patients have more options when surgery is needed. Now we travel to Minneapolis to learn more. Take a look. Neck pain is something we're all likely to be familiar with, whether it's talking on our phones, working on the computer, or just having a stressful day. In fact, it's estimated that about 50% of us struggle with some type of cervical disc degeneration, and the numbers continue to rise as we age. Degenerative disc disease of the cervical spine is nothing more than wear and tear. Uh, the discs are the cushions between the bones of our neck, and as we age, uh, they lose some of that water, and as the water comes out of it, they degenerate. For most of us, the aches and pains are occasional, but for many, neck and the associated arm pain can be severe, and for some, may lead to disability and the need for surgical intervention. If you get enough wear and tear to the disc, and sometimes it's even arthritis to the joints of the neck, it can narrow the hole for the nerve. As that nerve is narrowed, and compressed more and more and more, it can start to give the symptoms of radiculopathy. And some people it affects greatly, it profoundly affects their 
their pain level, their ability to function in society, to take care of themselves and their family. For Katie, a busy mother of three, what she thought were typical aches and pains seemed to be getting worse day after day. A couple of years ago, I started to notice some pain that was in my neck. Pain where I would feel like, oh, I should go get a massage, or I should, you know, maybe I'm a little bit sore there. It started on my neck, it started to go down my arm. I was feeling the, the pain then in my hands and, and feeling like there was a weakness. It was not going away. It was getting more severe day by day. The conservative treatment is always the best way to start. Conservative therapy for uh, neck pain for degenerative disc disease is simple things like activity adjustment, maybe avoiding the thing that was causing the problem. Uh, it can be taking anti-inflammatory medications, it can be physical therapy, chiropractic, all of those things can have a, a very positive effect on people's pain in their neck. Katie sought the opinion of a chiropractor and soon immersed herself into a routine of physical therapy, massage, and corticosteroid injections, hoping to find some relief. I had an injection, which my first injection, I did have some relief from my pain. So I thought, this is great. We've solved it. I've done the PT. I've got this injection. I'm feeling good. I went on a vacation. And a few weeks later, I started to get that that dull pain, I was like, oh, nope, time to go back to the specialist. He prescribed another injection. That injection did not work. When that second injection did not work, I was sad. I was defeated. And then at that point, the physician, the specialist that I was seeing, referred me to a spine specialist. When patients have tried conservative measures that haven't worked for them, they generally come see me and we talk about other surgical options. Hopefully it's after six weeks or so of conservative measures. We then talk about sort of two options to open up the nerve from the front part of the neck. The first part would be a traditional ACDF, anterior cervical discectomy infusion. That's been around for 50 years. We go in, we make a small incision in the front part of the neck. We go down, we scrape out the bad disc and the bone spurs that are pressing on the nerve. And when we're all done, we put in a piece of bone and a small plate. It works, it's a very good procedure. Another option besides the fusion is a cervical disc replacement or cervical disc arthroplasty or the MOBI-C. The MOBI-C is, for lack of a better term, a disc replacement. A, a, people can think of it like a knee replacement. You go in and instead of placing a block of bone and a plate and locking the level together, you put in a device that continues to move like a normal disc. The, really the only difference between the two is at the end of the day, the fusion stops the motion and the disc replacement allows continued motion. One of the things that I was concerned about when I looked at all the options or even thinking about having surgery is what am I gonna be like afterwards? Am I gonna be able to move my neck? In talking with Dr. Wills about what the MOBI-C product does is that was going to get me to the point where I wanted to be which was to have full mobility in my neck and alleviate the pain that I was feeling. After weighing all the risks and benefits, Katie decided to have the cervical disc replacement surgery with the MOBI-C. The implant was designed to try to mimic normal neck range of motion as much as possible. We've taken the concepts of continued motion and put it in the neck. A good candidate for a disc replacement is an adult who has attempted non-operative measures that hasn't worked and continues to have nerve type pain or weakness or problems, that radiculopathy, who wants to do some other surgical option than a fusion. Waking up from the surgery was great. Dr. Wills had explained to me, when I get into recovery, when I woke up, I would be in pain, 
there would be pain in, in the incision area and then in the back of my neck because that's where they do the work. But the other pain, the pain that, that got me there, this whole journey, that pain, hopefully would be almost gone or completely gone. And when I woke up, it was gone. The disc replacement Moby C surgery is a procedure that I've noticed in my patients they've recovered quite quickly from. They've done very well. They, they notice that the pain is not very bad in their neck. It's surgical pain, it's incision pain, but they don't have that nerve pain, that radicular pain anymore. And it makes a world of difference to take away that type of pain. As I sit here four months post-op, the thing that comes to mind is I wish I had done it sooner. To find a trained Moby C surgeon in your area, visit cervicaldisc.com. And as always, you can go to our website, thebalancingact.com. so much behind the mystery today. We always do. And remember to head to our Facebook page and our website. Follow us on Twitter. And also Instagram at Julie and Olga. That's right. Thanks for watching, everyone. We'll see you next time. So long, everybody. Mm-hmm.